I'm Quinn Ewers. My name is Adrian O'Neill. I'm Shay Holly. And Roy Harmon. My name is Marcellus Moore. My name is Rodney Terry. I'm Coach Sark. My name is Sam Hurley. This is Casey Kane. Hi, we're Texas Women's Tennis, and you're listening to Twin Rivers. to Between the Horns, the official podcast of Texas Athletics. My name is AK. I'm Peyton Wilson. You might recognize our guest today from his monster sacks on the field. He's the perfect embodiment of all gas, no brakes. Thank you so much for taking the time, David. Thank y'all for having me. Sure. Let's start with, how does it feel to be Alabama? <laughs> Man, it's a real great, free, great feeling, and it was a great achievement for the yeah. team, honestly. It was just all around... There's no feeling, like no better feeling, honestly. I can't even describe it in words. It was just really good to finally be able to prove a lot of people wrong and just do it together as a team. Can you take us through some of the preparation that you guys took to get there? <sighs> Where do I begin? <laughs> just from the winter, it was hard, long, grueling, but we had to get after it because we knew that we had a goal in mind, and that goal was the Big 12. And beating Alabama and just the other teams that we're going to face later on the li- later down the line they're just they're not going to just roll over with us leaving the Big 12 they're going to they're going to try to prove a point that you feel me that Texas is not that but it was a long hard process in the summer it was very hot very hot just I remember just days of us just running at four o'clock and two just just getting after it, it was really hard but it was all worth it because even the first game, Rice, when we were out there, I'm looking around and my left and my right, they have other players on their team. Great team, by the way, but they had other players on their team cramping and stuff. And I'm just like, where? This isn't. Yeah, this we, we were ready for yeah, this. Yeah, this is a regular <laughs> day to us. Credit to Coach Beck for getting us ready for that. But it was a long, hard process, but it was well worth it. That's awesome. And I, I think I saw um, either a stat or something where it was like the field, the temperature of the field was like over like 120 degrees or something during the Rice game. Um, so, for y'all, like, can you walk us through what like a typical summer like workout session for Texas football looks like? Okay, a typical workout session, obviously, middle of the day, hot, <laughs> grueling, just <laughs> miserable. But um, we start off with our typical warm up with uh, Coach Becky. He does a great job of getting us warm and ready to really run. And then we start off with a simple. Just a simple warm up to get us working on our speed mechanics. We'll do high knees, uh, ankling, and just different stretches in between that. Then we'll do plow metrics. Then we'll get to the running. For instance, on Wednesday, we'll do this thing called Longhorn Shuttles. And those that's one of the harder <laughs> things. I'm, I wouldn't wish that upon anybody, but uh, that's one of our harder workouts. But that's really where we build the mental toughness that he prides the team on having. And that's really what I believe helped us set ourselves apart on being a mentally tough team. Well, I mean, you've built the mental toughness and then you're two weeks in and then you beat a team like Alabama. How do you guys keep your head on straight and focus on the rest of the remaining season to play? Like I said earlier, beating Alabama was a great achievement, great win, and they were a great team, but we're looking for a Big 12 championship. And like I said, we're leaving the Big 12 and no one respects us. Even after that win, people still don't respect us. So we haven't even really done anything yet, in my opinion, honestly. Until the, we win the Big 12 and continue on winning, like we haven't done nothing yet. Gotcha, yeah. And obviously, the I can imagine, because I was at the game, the Alabama game last year, and that environment was electric. Um, so what was it like walking into their place? Kind of the, the even the pregame process, you fly there, and then ultimately, what is you know, Coach Becky? What does Coach Sark tell you all in the locker room? Mm, the pre, the pregame, uh, just walking out there, warming up. Everyone's obviously there, jawing, talking. But Coach Sark just said, "Believe and trust in him." And I really felt like the team, we as a team, we were we got closer over the summer, and we really started following what Coach Sark was saying. And I really truly believe that we trusted each other and loved each other more. And that belief and love for each other really helped us get that win. And he told us, look, I already, they're a great team, but us together, when we do what we need to do, we'll be able to get this win. And he said, just trust us. And that's all he said to do and execute. That's it. And as you can see, that's what happened. What's it like playing for Coach Sark? Ah, man, what's it like playing for Coach Sark? He's a very demanding coach. He demands the best out of you on and off the field. and. Honestly, it's really 
it's really fun but challenging at times. But he, it's only challenging because he wants to make you better in every aspect. Not only he wants to emph emphasize consistency and being intentional. And I feel like those two things really help me to grow on and off the field and to help the team really get better and excel in many different areas that we needed to. Gotcha. Yeah. And now you're, you're a leader on, on this team in the D unit. So what does this jump in this off season meant for you, not only like performance wise on the field and the skills you've developed, but also like, you know, mentoring these young guys who are coming up now? Honestly, my role in mentoring the young guys to me is very important because if we want to keep building a winning tradition, we have to help mentor the young guys and help them because we, for the team to really work, we need everyone on board, even the younger guys included. We need a good scout team look. We need special team players, and we need people to contribute on the field as well. And overall, better better people make better players. That's one of my uh, that's a quote that my coach uh, Coach Chout said. And after really going through what I've been through at UT and really maturing off the field, I truly do believe that that better people make better players. So it's really important to me to help the younger guys, mentor them, and help them realize what's right from wrong and get to the day of day of UT here. And, you know, some of the greatest mentors were great mentees first. And, I mean, you've been here for five years, so I know that there have been a lot of players that have passed through. Who were some of those guys who were mentors for you? <laughs> There's a lot of guys. Uh, one guy that uh, he plays for the Bengals now that I kind of sort of looked up to a little bit and how he played on and off the field was Joseph Osan. He had a really great motor but was a great person also. He would be willing to take me to the side and really help build my confidence and steer me right from wrong. And... I feel, and also Sam Ellinger. Sam Ellinger was a great leader on and off the field, and everything he did was very business-like, almost like how Coach Sark said to be intentional in everything you do. He was very intentional. And another guy who sort of, he, he wasn't like an older guy, but someone who embodied that intentionalism and business-like approach was Roshan Johnson. How he did everything was, how you do everything is how you do anything, and he really believed in that. And I felt like how he did, how he took everything, his approach on life, school, and football. I just sort of try to embody that myself. Yeah, that's amazing. What would you say your biggest um, like jump or progression has been this off season, either mentally or on the field? I would say we're just being, just developing a consistent schedule and being more like consistent with everything I do. Not just having one good day and then, oh, he's, eh, he's, he's, he's there, but he doesn't do much. But, and also film study, just sitting back saying, what are these offenses trying to do and stuff like that. Just getting a better understanding and grasp of the game. Speaking on your growth as a player, how has your growth been since the moment you stepped foot on this campus to today? <laughs> It's been a long one. I'm going to my fifth year, and I'm not gonna lie, my me as a freshman compared to me and now are almost two different people. <laughs> I mean, I'll just say, yeah, I was I would work hard, but I would do B plus work. That's because it got me up to this point. But there would be little things I could have done more. And I was just thinking back on like even like last night I was having a conversation with one of my friends like me staying after in the weight room or taking more time to do recovery or looking at more film and just sticking more to the older guys and just seeing how they move around would have probably benefited me more as a freshman, but that's more of what I do now, my day-to-day -day and schedule, and that's why I'm doing better. Sure. Something I'd love to know is, you know, the, the transfer portal is obviously such a big thing now, and I'm sure it would have been so much easier for you to submit your name and get, you know, your pick of schools and go there and, you know, maybe get more playing time, right? But why do you choose to stick at Texas? And now, obviously, it's it's been, um, you've been having a great experience, but what, what made you stick around? Well, it was just kind of like, for me personally, this has just been who I am, who, like, who I am, because even in like high school, I didn't feel, I wasn't getting really recruited much at Cinco Ranch, but and then there was an opportunity for me to go to say KD, where they're going to state championships, they're winning, and other guys over there are getting recruited, like even like Moro Ojimo, he was getting recruited and just seeing stuff like that, but, my mom gave me the, like, the option to do that, but I told myself, nah, like, I, this is what I know. I'm going to stick it out, and if I just play good, they're going to obviously notice me. So I felt like me being here at UT, um, I just felt I was 100% committed to this university, and I wanted my degree here. So I felt like I just need to find little ways to get better in, in like football and just off the field, and everything will take care of itself. What have been some of your favorite memories since being at Texas? <laughs> What are my favorite memories? Uh, I say one would be would have to be seeing Roshan start at running back, 
because I knew he was a hard worker and a hard runner, but just seeing him actually like tote the ball and just hurdle somebody, that was really funny. <laughs> that was funny. That was really funny. And then I'd say another one, uh, LSU game, my freshman year. That game was electric, real like SEC energy. I, I messed with it because that was my one of my first real big games here and being a freshman, just going out, seeing, first of all, driving in, seeing the sea of purple and yellow and then the orange on one side of all the fans. I seen the horns down and the horns up. It was really cool. Then to just run out and just hear the, the crowd roar, like that was really nice. That was fun. You know, when you think about the DKR environment, you know, obviously you broke in attendance record after attendance record. What does it feel like to play in DKR? Uh, I work out in DKR all the time, but just even when I'm working out, I always just close my eyes and just imagine just hearing the hearing the roar of the crowd yelling just loud and stuff. It's really just there's no other experience like it, honestly. There's nothing else like it. It's it's really just fun. Tell me this. We're talking a lot about the uh, positives and the upsides of you being here at Texas. What are some of the challenges that you've gone through and that you've been through and persevered through here? Honestly, it was just growing up and just really maturing and realized what I wanted off the field, you know. There's off the field thing, issues that I had to deal with and stuff. And like Coach Sark says, you have where you avert your focus is very important with him. That's why off the field stuff is very much uh, an emphasis on his. He has like three different three different spheres that he looks at. Social, your football, and just your school life. So if one of those little circles isn't going right, obviously the other two are going to be out of whack. And sometimes it would be school for me. I had to catch up on things, right? things here and there, and, or it would be social. I'm doing too much here, not focusing on other things. And I feel like when I finally got all those three in order, I was able to really just focus on what I wanted and put all my energy into football and just getting better. Gotcha, yeah. And how do you, how do you, or do you have any tips on how you kind of balance your schedule? Obviously, you know, being a football player, but also like finding time to enjoy Austin and be a, still be a college student, obviously getting your degree. Our first thing would be, we had to be, just be responsible and time management is very, very important. When I first got here, they would stress it, but I'm like, ah, okay, like I made it here, I made it here, but being five minutes early to meetings and being on top of your stuff allows you to have just mental clarity and you're calm and you're not frantic and having to worry about everything, this and that, when you're trying, as you're trying to focus on getting better at this. Like, I'm, wouldn't, it wouldn't have to be, oh, I'm in tutoring, oh, you missed this, like, oh, snap, I gotta go, I gotta go run over here, or oh, snap, like, you gotta go take care of this while I'm, as I'm watching film, like, oh, I can't, can't watch film, I gotta go take care of this. It takes away from you trying to get better and just be better at everything you wanna do, so. I feel like time management is key, very much important. When it comes to young athletes who may be listening or watching and looking at you and saying, I want to be where he is one day, what is the mindset that they have to have to get there? Honestly, it's just to attack every day and try to be the best, <laughs> like every, everything you do. Because this process, it didn't start for me in the winter. It started like, well, spring. Spring, I looked at it like, okay, like I'm going to my – I'm going to be one of the older guys on the team. I want to play. Obviously, what I've been doing before hasn't been working clearly, so I need to attack this with a different mentality. I want this. So every day it would be, okay, it would be just be where my feet are at and how am I going to be the best at, best David Bender today? And I just took that approach with every day from winter, summer, spring football, and then fall camp, and here I am now. So just attack the day. And if you can go back and tell your freshman self one thing, one piece of advice, the piece of advice, what would you what would you tell him? Bro, just grow up. <laughs> just grow up, really. Yeah. That's what I would tell myself. Just grow up and just what do you want to do with your life? Like what do you really want to do? And that's the only two things I tell myself. I wanna kinda of dive into that a bit though, because most freshmen who are coming here to play football or to play a sport like football. You, it's hard for you to grow up. I mean, everyone around you, there, there can be yes men around you. There can, there's so many different situations. How can you grow up? It would just be, honestly, just being real with yourself. Like, I felt like I, I didn't really, I thought I was good, but there is more I could have left out there, you know? There's more, more rule, how do I say this? There's more gas left in the tank that I could have really used to get better. And I could have been more intentional about 
finding new ways to get better instead of, oh, I did good today. All right, all right let's just leave that alone and let's go focus on something else. I'd say, but make this your main priority. Make the main thing the main thing. Exactly. I mean, I want to talk a lot about, um, you know, the Houston area and, and kind of growing up. Obviously, I'm the, the, the Dallas minority here. We got, we got two, we got two, we got two Houston people. Um, Nice plan. Yeah, no. <laughs> we, we weren't we weren't playing. <laughs> but how was it growing up in Houston? Can you describe that? I guess like the the Texas like high school football environment. Uh, the Texas high school football environment, man. It's it's there's nothing else like it in my opinion. There's we always have debates in the locker room of who has better football, whether it's Texas, Florida, or Cali, and I tell them all the time. You see the stadiums, you see the teams, you see the uniforms, you see the talent we got. There's nothing else like Texas high school football. And I felt like just playing at that level over there helped me to really realize and getting a love and passion for football. Because I didn't start in Little League. I started in middle school. So I was kind of a little bit more behind than the others. But just getting into it, learning and seeing the different names and the different people, it just wanted me to get better and just always get better. And just like even how they built, like how we were talking about earlier, Legacy, Legacy Stadium. Yeah. Like, I'm used to playing in little old rows and they're building a grand spanking new bigger stadium right next door. And it's just like my like for like my first time playing there was just it was so crazy. It was playing Katie High School, one of the powerhouses in Texas High School football. But it, there's nothing else like it in my opinion. Can you talk about like and for those who don't know, uh, David is from Katy, Texas, which is a suburb um, about 20 minutes outside of Houston. And in Katy, we kind of live, breathe, and eat football. So essentially, uh, David went to Cinco Ranch. And um, if you're unaware of the dynamics, uh, Katy is the powerhouse. Um, everyone wants to be at Katy. And then there's Tompkins, which is kind of like right under Katy, which they're becoming a new powerhouse. Going to a school like Cinco and playing teams like Katie and Tompkins yearly, how did that, how did that improve your, your drive for competition, your desire for competition, desire to win? Honestly, like, for instance, like Katie Week, our goal was to beat them, and I felt like I just looked at it like, okay, let's go. Like, I'm not worried about anything you're selling me. Like, I'm going to beat them or I'm going to be the best, and, like, playing against like DeAndre Glass, who was rushing for almost like what, like a thousand yards and stuff like that. He was killing it. <laughs> yeah, just playing against like him and then going against Tompkins, dealing with Milro at the time. That was honestly, it just made me want to keep playing and getting better to like prove that like, we're not just going to be a single ranch, not a pushover school. Like we're going to give you our best and we're going to give you a run for your money. So it just helped me want to get better more and play better people as it like went on. Real quick, speaking of Milro, um, last week, was that your first time sacking him, or? Because <laughs> I, 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 was, I was wondering. That, that's not your first time sacking him. Nah, I, I didn't think so. That's not my first time. So. That wasn't my first time sacking him. Nah, that wasn't. I think that was like my, I want to say third or fourth. A little bit of deja vu. Yeah. yeah. You can rub that in a bit. I was going to say, it looked a little too comfortable. <laughs> this segment, we're going to be doing Rewind, where we take a look at the guests' plays and highlights and have them walk us through them. So since we talked a lot about sacking Jalen, why don't we take a look <laughs> a couple a couple of plays, uh, starting with actually the Rice game. Oh man! <laughs> All in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So right here, like start starting from I guess before the snap. Yeah. What are we reading right here? When I'm reading, um, my blitz is really just a blitz to find daylight. So what I'm doing is I'm going to let my D-linemen work. And if you know our D-linemen, T-Sweat, Byron and them, they're going to eat. So just be patient. I trusted my speed, so I already knew what I was going to get. And in previous conversations I've had with Byron, he said, look, give me that one-on-one -on -one with the center. <laughs> it's over with. So I said, look, all right. So I trusted him, let him get the one-on-one -on -one with the center. I said, let me just fit out Byron because I know the center's going to have to choose one. So he didn't choose either of us. <laughs> so we both got there, and that's what I was reading. I was just reading off Byron, really, because I already knew the front's an odd front, and him being the nose, I already knew that the two, the two linemen to the right, the guard and the tackle are going to really buy down with the ends. So I, it was going to be a one-on-one. -on -one. So being able to fit off Byron, he, he makes my job a thousand times easier. So just all my, in my opinion, all I had to do was just be fast with it because – 
I don't know if you were watching early in the game, I tried that same blitz, but the running back tried to pick me up, or, and JT Daniels got the ball off quicker. So I had to creep in a little bit, but still give myself enough time to let Byron work. So, and then, you know, that's how the play came to fruition, you know? Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, God. My knee still hurts. Look, man. That's a heck of a play. Like, we, we got to give you credit for that. Like, who's that heck of a play? My knee still hurts. Your knee still hurts. <laughs> My right knee still is hurting. All right, so from, from this snap, I think one thing, one thing I've noticed was you see something clearly because you start. Move a little you know, early. You know. Move a little you early. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what I saw here is um, I just I creeped in a little bit. I had to back off a little because Jalen J. Ford helped me make this play because he yeah. drew the protection of the lineman. And I, as soon as I saw the running back kind of creep up a little bit, I knew like, okay, just get some speed behind me. And previously when we were watching film, me and Jalen, we had a conversation. We saw how the, the running backs were blocking. And I already knew I was going to get a sack. It was just a matter of when because the running backs were a little soft on their protection. Great guys, but they were a little soft on their protection against Middle Tennessee. So in my head, I knew, all right, bet. One on one, you're going to make this. So I trusted and I believed it. I didn't anticipate him cutting me though. That yeah, just yeah. that just kind of happened. Yeah. I, that one, like I said, my knee hurts and stuff. But um, I already knew that Jalen was a uh, obviously from playing him previously. I knew that I had to get after and go. That's why I creeped up into the blitz, and I knew I had a one on one with the back. So after getting up, I just knew I had to get him down quickly. That's why I reached for his legs in the celebration. <laughs> that was all. Is that, is that the favorite song? Is that the go-to now? Uh, that, now? that might be the go-to, but that was, a, that was something me and Jalen were working on in practice yeah, yeah, yeah. earlier. Well, what are some other celebrations? Or right, keep it secret, but what's, what's the one you want to pull out? Man, hey. Y'all yeah. yeah. don't see him. Y'all don't see him. I'm going to give you one after to see you. Okay, yeah, I'll give it well, thank you for breaking those plays down for us, David. I feel like my football IQ just went up quite a bit. AK, yours went up too? Yeah, that's another reminder that I, I can't do this on the field. <laughs> <laughs> well, this next segment is called This or That. It's pretty self-explanatory, so I'm going to let my guy AK take the lead. Starting with upper body or lower body lifting? Uh, sun's out, guns out. I'm a, a okay. Arms, arms, <laughs> arms. Yeah. Okay. Madden or 2K? Madden. That was easy. PlayStation or Xbox? Ooh, because I'm not going to lie. I started off with the 360, then I switched over so to P4, then the P5. Yeah. So I'm going to have to go PlayStation. What's, what's the current go-to game? Current go-to game. I would have to say either Fortnite or Call of Duty. Which COD? Which COD? The new one. Okay. Modern Warfare. Okay, okay. Who's the best COD player on the team? <laughs> <laughs> the best? Uh, Zay's pretty good. Zay's pretty good. Uh, who else? Uh, oh, Sweat's also really good. I played with him. Y'all got there. a little squad going? Oh, yeah. We were in like, our own little private lobby. Oh, he said yeah, you yeah, got okay. the private lobby. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Show, a little stuff, something like that. Trackhawk or Charger? Oh, my God. <laughs> I, may, I may have had some intel. <laughs> <laughs> I may have had some insight. This is too good. You already know what I'm going to say. Track hawk all the way. Track hawk all the way. Like, dream car. We know. <laughs> white uniforms or burnt orange? Um, white. I have to go all white. Yeah. Italian food or Mexican? Italian. I like a good lasagna. Okay. Chick fil A or Whataburger? Ooh, I was just at Chick fil A yesterday, but. Whataburger has my heart. Those patty melts never, they never do me wrong. That's the Texas choice. That's the Texas choice. Okay, lastly, lake day or beach day? I oh, don't know. I've fallen more in love with the lake because I've been in Austin. But the beach is cool. Beach. Yeah, beach is a vibe. The beach is a vibe. I had to go to the beach. Well, that was this or that. Thank you for playing along. Now let's dive back into the conversation with David. So, back to growing up in Katy. You mentioned something earlier. You didn't begin playing football until middle school. That's a late start in Texas. <laughs> That's a real late start. Can you tell me like how it was starting when I feel like everyone else around you was probably starting at the age of, like five? I mean, I was new there, so I didn't really know nobody. So I didn't really understand like, I was, that was a late start for me. But um, starting in middle school, my first position was offensive line and D-line. <laughs> okay. 
I uh, didn't really like offensive line, <laughs> but I still got it done because I was a little bigger than all the other kids. But um, D line is where I where I fell in love with defense really wholeheartedly. My favorite player at the time was Von Miller because okay. I saw myself just rushing off the pass, rushing off the end, and just being like him, a little hybrid mm -hmm. on the field. And I just loved D line, but it was a very interesting start introduction to football for me. It was fun running and realizing that. This is where I got a better understanding of the game and fell in love, made friends. Football, for me, starting off in middle school, allowed me to make my friends, really find the confidence in myself and get used to a new area. Because, like I said, I was new. I was a new, shy, quiet kid. Didn't really know the area I was in, but football allowed me to meet new people and really expand my horizons and just get a new experience. So it was, it was interesting. Being from Katy, I do have to ask, at my junior high, we had an A team, a B team, a C team, and a D team. A D team. We had a D team. What team were you on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for what sport? Football or basketball? Oh, you could tell us both. Okay, so football, it was pretty obvious, A team. No, all okay. throughout. Uh, basketball, <laughs> I was on a... Uh, Seventh grade, I was on C team. Hey, that's real. That's real. And eighth grade, I moved up to B team. There you go. You moved up. That's what matters. Yeah. <laughs> so, what was that? What was the first moment that you realized, like football, you wanted to do this, like longer term? Was that middle school, or what was that? I guess play or moment like. Um, I'd have to say eighth. Well, my eighth grade year, we played a school called Beckendorf. You know it. Yes. And then um, I remember I came off the edge, and I just like killed this kid and everybody was like oh my goodness like like even my head my one of my coaches was calling me like Nigerian nightmare he gave me a whole nickname and I'm just like to me that was normal and I was just like I'm just playing football yeah. but looking back on it that was probably where I gained more confidence in myself and got like a better understanding of like I actually like this like I like hitting people and I like playing the sport and I like being good at it so I just felt like from that point on I just knew like yeah this is for me so you mentioned that nickname, um, Nigerian Nightmare. So are, are you a first-generation American? Yeah, my parents. I'm not even Nigerian. That's the funny thing. No, okay. That's uh, really funny. <laughs> but, um, yeah, my parents, they immigrated from Sierra Leone in 96. Then they had me four years. I was born in 2000, yeah, December 12, 2000. Nice. So how is your family, like, not being from America, has, how have they adapted to how big football is out here? Their adaptation to just America and the sports here, it's really where I get my hardworking mentality from because for them it was it was an adjustment. They had to go back to schooling and get a lay of the land and get a new job and stuff. Like I remember my mom telling me my dad's first job was working at HEB, being a bag boy and stuff. And he's obviously worked his way up and she was going through schooling and stuff like that. But them at first, my dad would come to a couple of games and stuff. My mom didn't even really want me playing football. Okay. Neither did my dad. I remember he would have me watching like the Celtics with the, what well, the big three was what Shaquille O'Neal, who else? Ray Allen. Yeah, Allen. Uh, oh, you're saying about you mean the Lakers? Uh, no, 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 I mean Rondo, um, Rondo Garnett, Rondo, Pierce. Rondo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, them. I remember that a vivid memory of just sitting there watching them play and stuff. They wanted me to play basketball. Oh, but okay. Obviously, I didn't. It's <laughs> like six three or six four. And then I just did it in middle school. I kept getting good at it. Then I went to middle. I mean, went to high school. Obviously, I was ahead. Then my so my sophomore year of high school, I was working out with older guys and stuff. And my dad, he would always just notice me. I'm I was sort of a guy that was just like, all right, I'm I'm about to go work out. All right, I'm waking up. I'm about to go work out. I'm about to go run. But I'm, I'm doing it for myself. So they obviously understood that I have a I had a passion for it. I loved it then other parents would talk to them about it. So they're like, oh, wow, like, you're really good, my son. Like, keep going. We're praying for you, just stuff like that. It was a really, it was really fun just seeing them sort of come along with it because they really didn't like playing football. <laughs> it was a growing experience. Yeah. They had to grow on them. Awesome. Um, but David, want to know um, kind of where, what you're thinking about in terms of, you know, the future and kind of what, I guess, avenues, you know, football or even non-football you're kind of interested in pursuing. Honestly, with football, well, like for me, I'm looking at a lot of different things. Like, my plan would probably be to go to the league and acquire some properties and stuff like that, and just chill on that, and then just get into like sports broadcasting and stuff like that. Just giving play by plays, be like Shannon Sharp, and just talk ball and just talk really all sports. Honestly, like, that's really the plan. Besides Shannon Sharp, who are some of your favorite sports broadcasters? <sighs> Do we like Skip Bayless? 
Yeah. Skip. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we like skip. Know. Skip. Skip. He has his opinions here and there that. Eh, but Look, um, I'm a Cowboys fan, so I love Skip. Okay. I love Skip. Skip okay. is great. <laughs> nah, I'm playing the Cowboys. They all right. They're all right. Uh, but um, who was that one player that used to play uh, basketball? What was his name? He was really cool. He was really cold. Uh, he gives really good, like, really good analysis. Of Are you talking about JJ Reddick? Yeah, JJ Reddick. I really like how his takes and how he really, from his perspective on being an athlete and just playing the game and how he looks at different things like off the field and just how different athletes tackle things. I really like him and how he like really does his job. Before you go, we have to ask you, what makes Texas elite? What makes Texas elite? Um, where do I begin? The reason why, I, uh, where do I start? Well, obviously the education, there's nothing like a Texas degree. That's why I stayed so long, because I was really, 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 really excited and grateful to even go to this university and get the opportunity to get a degree here. And congratulations, by the way. <laughs> thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, the football, there's nothing like Texas, like first of all, there's nothing like Texas high school football. So <laughs> obviously the University of Texas football, there's nothing else like it. And just the alumni and the resources here, being here, I've been able to meet different people, different mentors and different avenues. I have met with real estate guys. I've met with bankers. I've met with just top CEOs who have, and just people coming to talk to the team. Like even Sam Otter, he came to talk to us. Just getting the opportunity to meet with these people, pick their brains and just get an understanding of how they got to that point is just a blessing in itself. And I'm really thankful for it, honestly. So being a first generation American coming you're the first one in your family to go to college and to graduate from college? Yeah. Oh, no. My, my mom. My mom did. She went to U of H. Your mom went to U of H? Yeah, okay, so you're the second person in your family yeah, to go and graduate from college. Yeah. Tell me what that experience has been like and getting to put on that T-ring. Man, there was no other feeling like it. <laughs> it was just really, it was a really good feeling to know I've accomplished something like that in my family and to do so at the prestigious University of University of Texas. Just being able to do that and say I've done it just to see the smile on my mom's face and the joy of just finally making them proud in that regard, just, it just made my day. And just, it's one of those things I'm gonna carry with me forever. That's amazing. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Between the Horns. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Okay.